Great. Well, um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to our viewers and readers, wherever they might be. I'm Jonathan Geyer, Managing Editor of the American Prospect. And for those of you joining for the first time, we're a magazine of ideas, politics, and power. We put out about five stories daily, sometimes up to three newsletters every day. But we're really proud of our print magazine, which uh, you know we've just put out. And tonight, we're going to launch it and talk about some of the best features, reports, and stories in here. Uh, I'm really proud that this is our eighth issue that we've put to bed in the lockdown. And our team is really talented, scattered throughout the US. And uh, tonight we're gonna be talking about the cover package, how to build a green economy, sun, wind, and water. It's kind of our version of earth, wind, and fire. We're also gonna, going to uh, get into corporate monopolies, something we focus on in our daily report. Uh, a deep dive into Amazon, Alabama, and all the issues of unionizing and the power of workers against corporate monopolies. And finally, we're going to talk about the Biden administration, how they're addressing the immigration crisis left behind by President Trump, what's changed, what hasn't, what's going on at the border, including one of our reporters who was just down at the border last month. So without further ado, uh, our first conversation is going to be about the climate of opportunity. And obviously Biden is investing big right now. The Green New Deal is on the top of everybody's mind. Uh, I'm gonna bring into this conversation several of our writers and editors. Uh, Gabrielle Gurley, our deputy editor in this issue, writes about water. Uh, Brittany Gibson, our writing fellow, is reporting on wind energy. Joan Fitzgerald, a professor at Northeastern University, is going to be talking about her feature on solar energy and its potential. And then we have our founder, Bob Kuttner, who uh, put together an incredible full issue on the Green New Deal in 2019. And this, this package really builds on that. So I wanted to turn to Bob first, who writes in this issue, this provocative question of will Biden be radical enough? And Bob, kind of thinking back to your, your entire issue focused on the Green New Deal, now we're revisiting energy and the economy as it relates to it. Uh, I'd love to hear your initial thoughts and assessment of kind of how is it looking for Biden in terms of building a green economy? Um, on the one hand, Biden is doing a lot better than any of us had any reason to hope. If you go back to October, November, uh, we weren't sure he was even going to be elected. We weren't sure he was going to be allowed to take office. We assumed, based on his history, that he would govern more as a centrist. We did not dream that he would have a working majority in Congress because we didn't think the Democrats were going to take the Senate seats. So here we are, and even though he's got the barest of majorities, he's trying to govern as if he were Roosevelt, who had two-to-one majorities in both houses, or if he were Lyndon Johnson. And then on top of that, he has the, the, the challenge of, of climate change. So I think he's off to a remarkably good start. And the uh, amalgamation of an infrastructure program in the trillions of dollars with a energy conversion program uh, is just stunning. That said, the challenges are immense, even if he gets his program enacted, which is iffy because of the filibuster and because of Manchin's uh, inconstancy. Um, if you compare what the basic package was like for middle-class and working-class people um, after World War II, uh, Biden is gonna have to be even more radical in order to restore anything like the life chances that ordinary people enjoyed in the 40s and 50s. Uh, people in that era could raise a family on one income and uh, they could afford to buy a house uh, on one income and then use the increment of the value of that house to accumulate wealth over a lifetime. They could afford to go to college without debt. And so restoring anything like the package that ordinary people enjoyed in that era, and then on top of that, dealing with climate change will require Biden to be even more radical and to get his program through Congress. Uh, because if he doesn't, and this is the last point I want to make by way of introduction, you know, his window is about 18 months. He has to demonstrate to ordinary people that he is making a difference in their lives 
sufficient to peel away some fraction of the Trump electorate that might be willing to vote for Biden because Biden is helping them in their, in their daily life. Uh, if Biden can do that, then he has a chance of beating the midterm jinx where typically a new president's party loses a working majority two years in. Biden can't afford that. So it's kind of a race between uh, uh, the, the fate of the planet and Biden's uh, climate program. It's a race between what Biden can accomplish and the persistence of the Trump electorate. Uh, he has to run the table. Everything breaks right. But everything broke right uh, between November and March. So maybe everything will break right again. That's fascinating, Bob. And, and when it comes to the areas we're talking about tonight, I want to bring in our, our deputy editor, Gabrielle Gurley. What is the story with water? You, you talk about in our new issue, you know, how one small town in, in Pennsylvania, how the water system is emblematic of how companies and citizens are fighting for clean water. What do you, our readers and our, and our viewers need to know about, you know, America's water systems from, from this example you reported so deeply on? One thing that is uh, becoming apparent, at least in the state of Pennsylvania um, and in the cities, uh, in the states, excuse me, that um, the corporate entity that I talk about, uh, Sensor Utilities, is, is showing, is that there, there's a, a very slow creep to privatizing uh, pub formerly public utilities. Now, uh, the status quo today is that most uh, utilities, most water utilities are public, but what we're seeing in Pennsylvania is a concentrated effort by essential utilities through its water subsidiaries to buy distressed um, either utilities or um, well-functioning utilities in the case of Chester, Pennsylvania and its um, suburbs um, from a city uh, that is in distress. So we're seeing um, central utilities go methodically, not just in Pennsylvania, where it has significant um, influence due to the fact that it's a Pennsylvania company um, originally um, founded in Pennsylvania, but it's going around to uh, Ohio, Virginia, Texas, and doing the same sort of thing, which is buying up uh, water utilities in this particular case from communities that are in some sort of fiscal distress. And Chester, Pennsylvania, in uh, my article, Something in the Water, is a community in, in fiscal uh, distress. Um, the problem with all of this is that, does the United States really want to see creeping privatization um, of water utilities, most of which are now public? What happens when you get um, corporations involved? The first thing that happens is the rates go up. Uh, the community loses control of a vital asset and um, the corporation uh, exerts its, its will. Um, in places where this has happened in the past, for example, in, in Chile, um, under Pinochet, um, water was privatized. Now Chileans are fighting to get their, you know, their water back uh, as a public good. Uh, during the pandemic, um, one of the things that Central Utilities is counting on is fiscal distress. And that fiscal distress will spur a number of, util uh, number of communities um, to sell their assets uh, like water off to corporations in order to reverse their um, fiscal problems. So that in a nutshell is what's going on in the community of, of Chester. Chester is trying to sell the Water Authority, what's tied up in the courts now is whether uh, the surrounding communities who are also served by the authority um, have, to have the right to split the proceeds if the courts decree that uh, the, water part, uh, the Water Authority can be sold. And Gabrielle's written a lot also about offshore wind energy, which is something that Brittany takes up in this issue. Brittany Gibson, our writing fellow, uh, Tell us, I mean, what is the promise of offshore wind? Is this, you know, what, what were some of the surprising things you learned about this potentially um, massive industry and, and, you know, what more could be done? Uh, 
Yeah, for sure. I think the operative words there are potential and promise because offshore wind energy is new technology to the United States. Uh, it's not so new in Europe and some other you know countries in particular, but for the United States, uh, a lot of the people that work in offshore wind, both in the policy realm, as well as the labor, manufacturing, maintenance realm, see this as you know the new technology to bring up workers and also address climate change, income inequality. They see it as a, you know, a real vehicle for a lot of change. So in terms of what's happening currently with offshore wind, you have to follow it at the state level. States like New York and New Jersey, as you can imagine with the coastlines are really leading the way with very high commitments uh, in terms of gigawatts of energy hours. Uh, but they're followed closely behind by a lot of other states on the East Coast that just geographically have the right makeup for offshore wind. And again, because it's new technology, labor unions have been able to, you know, put their weight on this legislation, their weight on these state level promise or uh, state level plans and agendas to get project labor agreements in the mix, which is different as well from other renewable energy sources in the rest of the United States. What's still left to be seen, which Bob kind of hinted at earlier, is what is the Biden administration going to do? What would the federal level version of this state level effort look like? And that's still to be seen. You know, clean energy, renewable energy um, is definitely a part of Biden's infrastructure bill and some of his, if not executive orders, at least press releases. Um, but it's still very early. It's still very new. The potential is there is basically what's happening right now with offshore wind. Thanks, Brittany. And, and Joan, you write about solar energy. And I, I know you're working on a book about cities and climate change. You've written a book, Green Innovation on Urban Leadership and Climate Change. I get the sense from your article that China is leading the way on solar energy more than the US, or at least they, you know, they're making a lot more solar panels than we are. What more can be done to, or what, what could the Biden administration do to invigorate the kind of solar energy push? Yeah, well, let me, let me start, Jonathan, with the good news in that solar is the fastest growing source of energy in the United States. And the cost of that energy has declined dramatically just between 2010 and 2019, the cost of solar has gone down 82 percent. Um, but it is almost entirely dependent on Chinese solar panels. Um, about 72 percent of the panels are produced in the United States. But it's not just the panels themselves, it's the entire solar value chain. And so from the polysilicon to the wafers to the ingots, um, it's almost all produced in China. And so just as during the pandemic, we've learned that it's not a good idea to be dependent on one country for your PPE um, and, and for your pharmaceuticals, it's not a good idea in an energy transition to be almost entirely dependent on one other country for your um, solar energy. So. I make the case in the article that we need to reestablish a solar manufacturing industry on four grounds. One is national security um, in that if this is going to be our energy, we have to produce it. The other one is environmental in that much of the solar produced in China is in the Xinjiang region and it's, it's made from very dirty coal. So, we are producing our clean energy based on a dirty, dirty energy production process in China. The other one is ethical, and that has to do with the forced labor that um, has been identified in, in many of the production facilities. And finally, the economic development. These are good manufacturing jobs that we're missing out on. So I make a case in the article that um, we do have a solid base, a small but solid base of manufacturers in the United States. And some of them like First Solar in Toledo, Ohio are really committed to a, um, a domestic supply chain. Um, but we have to establish metrics for what is clean solar, good solar that we're going to be producing here and the ultra low cost solar alliance has established 
um, a set of eco principles for reducing the embedded carbon in solar. In addition, we really have to work with trade policy. And in the article, I talk about a number of um, uh, organizations that are arguing we really need to renegotiate all the trade policies we have so that we can implement Buy American in our solar policies. Bob, you've put together this package on solar, wind, water. You know, what's your takeaway as we're kind of growing our coverage as a magazine of a global Green New Deal, of what Biden can do on investment in a green economy, green energy? What do, you, what, what do our readers really need to know? Oh, You're muted. I need you to unmute, I'm sorry. It's been a long day. The, the takeaway is that uh, all of the infrastructure and economic development and jobs and trade policies uh, need to be married to green policies so that the, the two things go together. We, we have an energy transition to, to renewable energy at the same time that we're using that as an engine of economic growth. And as Joan indicated, that re requires us to really transform our trade policy so that we regain the right to have an industrial policy for American solar, American wind, uh, American supply chains, keep public goods like water public. So uh, the, the good thing is we've got a president who is committed to both things. And the, the, the challenge will be uh, implementing this in the right scale and uh, in the right details. Well, you can get a really good sense of what the scale is and what the details are in our new issue, Climate of Opportunity, Sun, Wind and Water. That's all we have time for this particular panel, but our event continues now with uh, bringing in our executive editor, David Dayen, uh, Alexander Salmon, our staff writer, and Louise uh, Leone, who's been uh, writing for us from Alabama about the unionization efforts at Amazon. So thanks so much, uh, Joan, Gabrielle, and Bob, and Brittany. Um, so to our Monopoly friends, uh, David's written this really intense deep dive on the music industry and monopolies. Alex has been writing about uh, you know, the meaning of Amazon as a company. Louise has been on the ground uh, amid these unionization efforts. So I wanted to put it to you first, David, how has, you know, the, mon the monopolization of the music industry affected musicians in the pandemic. That's what I was really looking to uncover. Uh, I, I have been writing about uh, uh, monopolies in a, in a variety of different forms for a number of years. And I do think it's best to look at the end user here, who, who the, the individuals who are really most affected by it and how, how they experience it. So um, I tried to take a, a bit of a historic sweep at the musician. You know, in, in the, from the third century on maybe, uh, the, the musicians were like the, the original gig workers. They, were, they went from town to town as troubadours. The only way that they could get paid for their work was through a patron. Uh, and it was a very, you know, it was, it was, it was a difficult job. So there's this one moment where technology affords the ability to commoditize the work. Uh, first with sheet music, which was a big seller, and then uh, a much broader impact of the phonograph and, and then recorded music that could be sold as a commodity. So people who weren't just musicians themselves could buy a piece of, of art. And so for a very short period, musicians could produce a piece of music, package it, and, and then get paid for their work, compensated for, for their labor. Uh, and this has ended over the last 20 years. This has essentially ended. We've moved into a position where this commodified work has become streamed. Uh, so streaming represents about 83% of music industry revenues, about five out of every $6. And the majority of it is coming through YouTube, Vision of Google, and Spotify. And uh, the major record labels have a piece of Spotify. That's why they gave the licenses to allow this music to go forward. So 
uh, musicians were put back sort of into a pre recorded state because the the the, uh, the 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 per stream rates for streaming are outrageously low they're like less than a penny right much less than a penny yes three tenths of a penny in the case of spotify and uh two one hundredths of a penny in in some cases in the case of of youtube and so uh it, there's no way for anyone to make a living uh as a musician unless you're a star unless you're established unless you are able to get billions and billions of streams. Uh, and, and so- you, so you spent a lot of time with this musician. I, I love the band Galaxy 500. You spent a lot of time with uh, Damon from that band. I mean, mm -hmm. he's become a real kind of activist for this cause of, of what musicians can do. Yeah. You know, what can they do against these powerful media? Well, this is what's interesting. I mean, everybody went back into this pre-recorded uh, uh, state, and then the pandemic made it impossible for uh, musicians to work through gigs, right? So uh, they had a lot of time on their hands, and they started organizing together. Uh, and, and Damon's organization, the United uh, uh, Musicians and Allied Workers, is trying through organizing and activism to force organizations like Spotify to pay them fairly uh, for streams, a penny a stream is what all they're asking for. Um, uh, so this is an opportunity now because it is still the case, much like in baseball and other organized uh, operations, uh, the, the, the talent has the power. Nobody goes to a concert to see the record label. <laughs> oh, I really need to see that, that, that Polygraph Records label. Um, so uh, there is organizing going. It's a nice parallel to, to what Luis and Alex have been working on because it's, it's really about organizing, which is the way out for musicians to find a place where they can actually survive as, as musicians. So Luis, you were kind of writing about organizing against Amazon, you know, the first major uh, union attempt in, in several years, obviously it, it faltered and we're about a week out now. What's your assessment of that? I mean, it's, it's a loss, but are there some glimmers of hope or is there a more complicated picture than, uh, than what was a pretty staggering loss for the unionization effort? Yeah, I mean, I think, thank you um, for asking the question and framing it that way. Um, I think that, yes, there's a lot happening internationally um, in terms of taking on Amazon. Amazon is an international company. The resistance has to be international. Um, and we have heard in recent days about the Amazonians United walkouts, which represents disruption at the last mile. So before a product gets to your door, uh, Amazon is setting up you know, uh, hubs in metro areas to make sure that they can satisfy consumer demand. Uh, so this loss uh, in Bessemer, I think it's important to see it for what it is. It was a loss. Uh, but from the very beginning, organizers and workers knew that the odds were stacked against them. These workers in Alabama fired a shot across the bow into the bloodless heart of Goliath. They missed this time taking into account the contested ballots, the split was 40 to 60. Uh, but, you know, the Teamsters are also going to take their shot. My bet is that workers will ultimately prevail and wounding Amazon enough to force the company into bargaining with its workers. Um, so the rumblings of workers are on the, you know, uh, workers are on the march and the rumblings are growing louder. But the path to victory will be strewn with many losses along the way before that rendezvous with victory. And that's the history of the labor movement from the sit down strikes mm. in Flint, Michigan in the thirties to the unionizing campaign at Smithfield in North Carolina, workers lose until they win. Another point that I wanna make is that as I've been thinking and reflecting about Amazon and you know, David talk obviously has been studying monopolies. I looked at a and and what happened, and I revisited an article that David wrote a few years ago. And the reason why I mentioned AMP and, and monopolies is that the pressures that will bring Amazon to the negotiating table have to be from below, but they also have to be from the top. So there is an antitrust you know, push to break up Amazon, to break up the big tech giants. And I think that's going to be really helpful. I think it would be naive to think that one facility is going to bring 
Amazon to the negotiating table. Even if the workers in Bessemer had won, one fulfillment center was not enough uh, to win a contract. There has to be more pressure along Amazon's global supply chain. Uh, let me let me and, just add to that. It's a great point that uh, Luis made. Uh, the A and P in the in the 1930s had, uh, uh, I believe, uh, something like 16% uh, of all groceries were sold there. Um, and there was a chain store law, it was government policy uh, that prevented uh, A&P from uh, forcing uh, discounts on its suppliers so that it could sell at much lower prices and undercut the competition. And that law was called robinson Patman, and it was in, it's still in place actually today, it's just not enforced. Um, uh, that was the way, in addition to organizing, in addition to, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the benefit of, uh, of, of consumers and the consumer movement, it was uh, government policy at the top forcing uh, a, a large business to change. And, and that's true about Amazon. It's going to be true if we're going to see any change in the large monopolies that dominate the music, music business. Alex, uh, you posed some almost like conceptual questions about Amazon in, in this issue. You review a new book called Fulfillment by, uh, by Alec McGinnis, is that right? McGillis. And, yeah. McGillis, sorry. And, and one thing you told me earlier, Alex, that was really interesting to me is, you know, Amazon was really popular in 2018. They were, you know, American polling in America showed them as one of the most popular American institutions. And I was wondering, has that changed? Is it, is the tide starting to turn for Amazon? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting question. And we talk about the union drive as well. Um, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, 2018, Amazon was one of the most trusted institutions in the country. Uh, and I think now, you know, obviously people who've worked in, in, in labor and progressive spaces have been, uh, in, in, in anti-monopoly stuff, have been sounding the alarm about Amazon for a while. Um, I think that that alarm has, has kind of you know, grow louder to the point that people broadly are are looking on Amazon as as less of a, or I guess more of a pernicious force, and and I think that actually it kind of tracks with the growth that we've seen in the company. That you know, three years ago it was still a large company, but it wasn't it wasn't salting away the profits that we're seeing now. And and you know, as as it's as it's grown and doubled and doubled and doubled again, it's finally kind of hit this this kind of runaway train stage where. The, the amount of money that they're that they're making is 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 astonishing, and the size is astonishing, and and the different sectors of the economy that they've dominated have become so great uh, that it's it's hard to compare Amazon to anything else. And I think that uh, it really has reoriented the American economy. I you know it's both it's both actively done that, and it's benefited from a number of kind of structural changes that we've seen over the past forty years. And I think this book this book. Uh, fulfillment that, that I reviewed in the issue does does a really great job of kind of conceptualizing what that change looks like um, and and how kind of American society, the American economy, you know, labor and consumption have changed, um, you know, how that, how Amazon was both a, a scavenger that, that kind of fed off of the carcass of, of trade policy and various institutional failures, but is also now very much a, a, a predator uh, and has, has, you know, uh, taken on other large corporations taking on local governments and has really found itself in the driver's seat um, in, in, in a lot of ways uh, in, in, in our society now. And, and I think that's probably, you know, a long way of saying that, you know, popular attitudes towards Amazon have changed. Part of that is activism, as Luis has pointed out. Uh, part of that is just the, the enormity of the operation is just unavoidable. And I think that there are people who are, you know, feeling you know the the squeeze as much as they're feeling the convenience that was you know so alluring uh you know years ago and when amazon prime was kind of first growing into its, its current form so i mean maybe this is a question for each of you you know before we wrap up wrap up this segment is does amazon's growth does the growth of monopoly power in the music industry does this reflect government failure i mean is this you know a reflection of local governments not standing up to Amazon, the New York, uh, you know, mayor and everyone trying to play games to get Amazon headquarters or second headquarters. Um, I mean, what's going on here? Maybe each of you guys can take a, a minute or so and, and tell me, you know, what you think about that. Well, real quick, I, I mean, I think Alex uh, 
puts it really well in his uh, review in the book, uh, in, in, in the print issue, that Amazon is really born of failure. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> we, we would not see this business at the size that it is if it weren't for an abandonment and neglect on the part of public policymakers. So uh, the answer is absolutely yes. As to how and whether that will change, I think there's been some change at sort of an intellectual level uh, at, at, and, and starting to be one at a, at a policymaking level. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I think Amazon is still very popular and I think it's still very trusted. And uh, we saw that in the pandemic. I mean, it, it doubled in size or, or something, hundreds of thousands of new workers. Um, I, I still think that uh, under a status quo environment, from a policy standpoint, we're going to see Amazon continue to grow and grow and grow. And, and uh, absent some large technical or institutional failure, that's, that's going to continue. So uh, it's incumbent to, to make this argument about uh, how Amazon is, is really drafting off of, of a, a government inadequacy. Um, but I'll leave it to Alex and Luis to continue. I mean, Luis, it seems like the government also didn't do enough to make sure that uh, it's, it's safe to unionize without retribution as, as far as reporting I've seen from other outlets. How did you see that you know, borne out on the ground? Um, so, I mean, I think Amazon is, is an outlaw. They, they get to do whatever they want. And we've, we've seen that happen even in places where workers' rights have strong like safeguards. So for instance, when workers in Germany strike, they reroute uh, the shipping through Poland and offer overtime to Polish workers to weaken you know, the bargaining power of German workers. So when it comes to people prostrate themselves before Amazon, like, you know, like beggars before, I don't know, a, a palatial prince or something. Um, and I think that that is the reality. I think to David's point, something that I've been kind of teasing and I haven't fully explored is to the extent that Amazon represents like state capture. Like Amazon is fully integrated in Amazon Web Services into the infrastructure of like, <laughs> like the defense department in this country. So that's why the question of breaking up Amazon, I think has really has Elizabeth Warren and others like really concerned because this country like, and it's not just like in the US, like Amazon really threatened, it represents a global threat, not only to workers, but even to the very foundation of what it is to live in a democracy. So I'll leave it at that. Alex, do you want to fill in anything else? Yeah, I, I think those are both great points. I, I would just add the thing that, that to me is, is, is kind of most galling about Amazon uh, and, and kind of a shocking component of this that I think is left out is not just that there's, you know, to total corporate capture of the state or that the state, you know, cowers a, a, in front of this, this, this massive organization. It's that in, in state and local government and, and federal government too, as Luis points out with federal contracting for the, uh, for the military, uh, you know, it's, it's the public sector that's paying for the expansion of this company. I mean, in a lot of significant and profound ways, uh, it, it's, it's the public purse that's underwriting the expansion again and again and again. And so it's one of these things where they've, you know, when you have a large company like that and you can, you basically have price setting capabilities and you dominate the market, you can, you, you know, you have a lot of power and a lot of wind at your back. When the federal government is paying you to expand, when state and local governments are paying you to expand, that's a whole other element, and and I think that that really shows the enormity of their of their power, and and uh, and that to disentangle from that is a, is another challenge that we're going to have to face up to at some point, and I think it's an important thing to add. Well, thank you all three of you for your contributions to this issue. We follow monopoly power, economic concentration, almost every day on our site. So sign up for David's daily newsletter, First One Hundred, looking at a lot of the economic angles of the first days of Biden. Alex is regularly writing stories on this. We've had a great series of articles from Louise. So please check them out, prospect.org. Uh, we're gonna keep Louise on this panel and we're gonna bring in our former writing fellow, uh, Marsha Brown. She's just started a new job as a correspondent at the Capitol Forum. But Marsha was just, uh, she was 
down by the border doing some reporting for the prospect. Um, Marsha, tell us, there's this very complicated dynamic right now with Biden being left with Trump's mess on immigration. And, and let's be clear, really, truly cruel and unusually harmful policies regarding refugees, migration, the way America works when it comes to immigration. But you've really focused in this issue on something called Title 42. Could you explain that to folks who, who might not be familiar with the, the legal dynamics here? Yeah, absolutely. So Title 42 is a public health authority um, that dates to an, a much earlier law from decades ago that um, Trump used starting in March 2020. Um, so it's been now over a year that the, the policy has been in place. And essentially what it did and does is shut down the border entirely. So there's there, it's not even as if an asylum seeker can come to the border and, and seek asylum in the United States, which is required by international and national law and American law. Um, and so this was really a way for Trump and his administration to achieve their, their policy objective, which was to make immigration in, in, in all forms harder to do or nearly impossible. And under the pandemic, that was really realized. And, and I should mention that at the time, this uh, public health authority, CDC officials objected. I mean, they, they really thought that this was not, it was kind of a bogus health order. There was no real public health benefit. Um, and to that point, when I was um, at the border, you know, I easily crossed the border. I never had a temperature check. I actually, not once did I have a temperature check coming back to the United States. Um, no such thing as a COVID test. Um, and so the idea that asylum seekers would bring COVID into um, the United States and, and make the pandemic worse is, is really just, is just false. Um, and so anyway, so this, so this uh, public health authority has been in place now for a year. And so for a year now, asylum seekers um, have been unable to access the asylum system in the United States. And there was a lot of talk when when Biden took over that this would be that he would really restructure policies and you know it's April now the clock is ticking and Title 42 is still in place um, and so what I looked at in this issue and and you know this a lot of things have happened since this issue came out now um, and uh, it's 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 causing probably more chaos at the border I mean by leaving this in place um, he's essentially not given anyone any direction about when they might be able to access the asylum system. It's created more confusion. It's certainly created a lot of harm. It's un unnecessarily cruel. Um, and, and families actually, a lot of people are saying that this is actually contributing to the unaccompanied uh, minor crisis because um, families come to the border, they arrive and they realize that the only way for their child to be safe from the cartels at the border is to send them over by themselves. So, I mean, this is, it's, it's not really clear to what extent um, that is proportionate to the, the entire unaccompanied minor crisis, but it is certainly a factor. And I mean, can you update us more broadly, Marsha? You've written, you know, you documented week by week for two years, all of the uh, the policies the Trump administration implemented, you know, we, we could even go back as far as, as the Muslim ban or so-called Muslim ban that this was an administration that was hell bent on stopping immigration. We've now had 85, 86 days of Biden. What's changed and what hasn't? Um, so I think, you know, Title 42 is actually a really important part of this puzzle piece that, you know, the borders are still not open um, in any capacity for people to access the asylum system. Um, and I, I think one major change is that he ended the migrant protection protocols remain in Mexico program, um, which under Trump forced asylum seekers to wait in Mexico for their asylum hearings in the United States and they were living in dangerous border towns at one point there were 70,000 people in the program. Um, there's only about 20,000 people with open cases, and he is in the process, his administration is in the process of processing those folks right now. Um, and so when I was down there, um, all of the folks who were living in this Matamoros, essentially a refugee camp, but it was asylum seekers, um, that camp was basically ended the first week that uh, Biden started processing these asylum seekers. Um, but other than that, if you don't have an MPP case, you can't access the asylum system. Um, and so what's happening with Title 42 is that um, folks are being um, expelled over the border, deported, um, and they don't get a formal deportation record in the same way that you would 
um, if you actually were deported in, in under normal circumstances. And so people try again and again and again, they might try twice in 24 hours. And so that actually disproportionately um, grows the numbers of apprehensions. So when you see these, these reports of, oh, there's a lot of people coming to the border, 40% um, I think was is the statistic of, of people are people who are trying multiple times um, in those, those apprehensions. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a misleading headline to write it like that. Um, so those are a couple of major changes or some things are staying the same. He did announce that he's going to be investigating white supremacy and in, in border patrol, um, which is, I think, a, a notable uh, move. He did try his 100 day moratorium on deportations, but um, that was quickly blocked by a, a judge in Texas and, and the government hasn't appealed that case. So it doesn't, it, you know, deportations have really kind of continued uh, normally. And then I think, you know, one thing that's recently been in the news that I think is pretty important is the refugee system. Um, so under previous administrations, uh, the refugee system has been about 100,000 people per year. Um, and this is completely different for asylum. It's completely different from other parts of the immigration system. It's, it's done through a different agency um, and people are vetted and, and processed over, you know, a three year time period. They have lots of paperwork that they have to go through in order to be welcomed in the United States as a refugee. Um, and so um, Trump really, he, he did two things. So he lowered the cap dramatically. So the cap is a 15,000 down from, I think it was 100,000 under, under Obama and Biden has said he wants to raise it to 125,000. Um, and right now we're actually only on track to welcome about 4,000 refugees this year. So not even hitting the cap of 15,000. And that's because of what's called the presidential determination, which which so is he just needs to sign one paper, right? Yeah, yeah, that's all he needs to do. Um, and he hasn't done it. And it's it's basically meant that there is kind of an effect of a Muslim ban, an anti-African ban for refugees, um, because they don't fit into any of the specific categories that Trump laid out in his presidential determination. So that's kind of low hanging. So I want to bring in. Thing. Why not? I want to bring in Louise, who's done a lot of reporting kind of on immigrant labor in this country. And he, he has this incredible story in our issue that, I mean, the headline is so depressing. It, it kind of speaks for itself. It's uh, workers making COVID test kits exposed to COVID. Um, I mean, just a horror show. Louise, could you tell us, I mean, can you sum up this story for us of kind of how you put this together and, and, and the kind of the, the people you were you were interviewing and, and, and this kind of you know, quite tragic tale. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the themes, like, similar to what Marsha has said, is that there's this tension between people being essential, but also being disposable. I don't think at the border, people necessarily see the folks that are seeking refuge as essential. Uh, but we know that they are essential, because a lot of them come to work in this country in sectors of the economy that you know, U.S. Uh, uh, citizens and residents don't don't work in like agriculture, um, for instance. So, so this story is part of my what I call like listening to the lower frequencies, right, of worker struggles. So it's a line that I'm paraphrasing from Ralph Ellison's book, Invisible Man. So I, in addition to that story. I wrote a story about the subway uh, cleaners, uh, right. which ties into like another group of workers that are essential that went into the subways after the pandemic to clean, do these uh, nightly scrub downs and were exposed to the virus. So in this story is a similar dynamic where workers producing COVID test kits and anti assembling them uh, and antibody tests, they themselves were exposed to the virus at this uh, plant uh, in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, throughout the pandemic, they worked um, while the rest of us hunkered down at home, had Amazon deliver us packages. We are guilty of it, no shame. Um, but the idea is that there's this discrepancy about like who, who is essential, right? And who is disposable. And these workers were definitely deemed disposable. So they had to fight even for hazard, uh, I mean, for sick days. So they are temp workers. So that means that the volley of responsibility was tossed back and forth between uh, the facility 
owners and this temp agency. So what I did in this story is I learned about the issues they were facing. I went down to New Brunswick, waited for the shift change. I saw that a lot of them were paying for transportation in these vans. I followed the vans to this employment agency, saw them lined up waiting to collect their checks. And as they were waiting, they were not even the company, the, the subcontractor was not enforcing COVID-19. And there are some contradictions where the signs are put on the plexiglass, maintain six feet. And here are these folks jammed up trying to collect their weekly checks. Uh, some of these workers were paid uh, with uh, debit cards um, instead of pr being provided with a check. Many of them, like the subway cleaners, are undocumented. So they had no other choice but to go into these jobs. There's, the CDC says that nearly 20% of the folks that died of COVID-19 were between working ages of 18 to 64. Um, and that kind of tells us that this pandemic was a labor crisis. The people that died were workers. And every story in 2021 was a labor story to some extent. And that's what I've tried to cover is those stories of the workers at the lower frequencies. Yeah, I mean, we've been covering this as a magazine when it comes to strawberry pickers in California, whether it comes to uh, meat packers who make sure we have chicken or beef on supermarket shelves. So it's, it's really, you know, you're talking about one group of workers, but I, I'm sort of thinking in my head, wow, I, you know, as an editor, I've been we've been covering this on every dynamic. Uh, Marsha, before we let you both go, I want to ask you, you had this fascinating scoop uh, about a week or two ago about a CNN video that was showing, you know, migrants coming across the border that, you know, you said was staged. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, so the story, essentially a, a lot of advocates who work on the border and are familiar with what the border is like and what the river is like, um, they saw a couple of videos, two different videos. They appeared to show similar scenes or the same scene, but I think they were just, they were two different scenes. Um, and they showed uh, migrants crossing the Rio Grande in the middle of the day um, in little inflatable boats um, led by masked smugglers. So they had a ski mask and they were wearing fatigues. Um, one video went viral on right across right wing media and was shared by um, two members of Congress. Um, and in that video, you can hear two people discussing in the background what, and it, it sounds like one of them is, is perhaps a law enforcement officer. So there are all these implications that uh, Border Patrol was perhaps involved in this. Um, that area of the river can only be accessed by a, a boat slip that is that appears to at least be supervised by Border Patrol, if not controlled by Border Patrol. The second video was aired live on CNN. And um, basically a CNN reporter went out in the boat um, trying to get access to see what the river was like. And they said that they stumbled upon this, this incident um, and they saw the same thing of, of they watched the boat go back and forth six times. Um, and at, at no point did Border Patrol appear um, to apprehend people or try to stop people. Um, and, and also it's a really dangerous thing to cross the river. So there were no humanitarian rescue efforts made either. Um, and, and CNN actually went out in the boat with um, a local Republican candidate um, for a local office there. Um, so there's, there's a lot of questions surrounding the video, especially with uh, what's going on with Border Patrol. Um, and there does appear to be an internal investigation in the uh, Office of Professional uh, Conduct right now. Um, but other than that, there are too many updates. Well, that, that's, uh, you know, part of what we will continue to focus on as a magazine are questions like that. I wanna thank you so much, Marsha and Louise for joining us tonight. Uh, I wanna thank all of you at your home uh, who tuned in. Uh, this is what independent journalism looks like. We're covering the labor dynamics, the green energy and green economy dynamics and all economic questions related to the Biden administration and beyond. And if you like what we're doing, uh, I'd really encourage you to, to subscribe. We're trying to get a thousand new members of the magazine this month. Uh, you can find all of our coverage at prospect.org. There is no paywall and we wanna keep it that way. So we need your help. And I really wanna thank uh, the behind the scenes folks here, Anna Greisbord, who is you know, our PR director and made everything happen tonight. Stephen Whiteside, our publisher, Ellen Meany. 
and, and most of all, our whole team of editors, writers, and especially our interns who make this issue come together. We're really proud to launch it and uh, we hope you subscribe. So check us out and see us in two months. Uh, we're the American Prospect. Thanks for being here tonight.